Jonathan's doing a great job leading songs. And that last song is certainly an amazing song. Full of hope and causing us to focus on things not of this present world. If you would please turn with me to a very familiar passage in the New Testament, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. He has just finished Colossians 3.16 in verse 15 saying, Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Then he says, And remember the force of let. It is the force of a commandment. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now, you might note what follows that verse and realize the context in which verse 17 is in, uh, noticing what preceded it, what comes after it. It all has to do with submission to proper authority. But I want us to focus on Colossians 3 and verse 16. This will be fundamental and first principle, and more familiar with many of you than maybe some. But in Colossians 3.16, Paul gave two things Christians do when we engage in singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. First of all, notice we teach one another. And next of all, number two, we express our devotion and praise to God. I want you to keep that in mind as you note what he's doing in that verse and the message he's conveying. As an act or avenue of worship, we know that we are to sing. But all around us, there are churches that are worshiping God and they're using mechanical instrumental music or some other kinds of music when they do engage in worship with God in music. You can read all you want to, and you ought to, that the New Testament of Jesus Christ has to say about music and the worship of God, and you'll never come up with anything but S-I-N-G-C. But we must realize a great many people are not approaching the Bible, and especially the New Testament, to seek the authority of Christ for what they believe and for what they practice day by day and when it comes to worship. So... What about using mechanical instruments of music or other kinds of music in the worship of God? Is this a problem? Is it just simply an optional matter or is it just one of preference? Over the years, people have tried to say it's just a matter of if you want to, you can. If you don't want to, you don't have to. Or they try to say, and say that, well, you folks just don't like mechanical instruments of music. It's not your preference, so you just sing. But why do true Christians, just as that word's defined and used in the New Testament, why do they engage in singing only when it comes to worshiping God in music? Why don't they employ other kinds of music when they worship God? Now, we're looking at this from the standpoint of the kind of music God's authorized, whereby He wants to be worshipped. But I'm telling you, when you understand the reason that members of the Lord's Church, when they worship God, sing and sing only, you will see what sets aside Christians from everybody else in the world, even what makes a Christian like you read of in your own New Testament. And you'll see what separates the church that Jesus built, Matthew 16 8, 16, 18, and, verse, and Acts chapter 2, from all those founded on the commandments and doctrines of men. Note that, founded on the commandments and doctrines of men. It is a problem that people don't realize. They will proclaim long and loud 
Jesus is King. Jesus is Lord. But the implications of that they do not see. If I acknowledge Christ as King, then I'm saying I do what He says and the way He says it and for the reason He says it. And the only place I can find those things are in the words of His last will and testament, the New Testament. Churches that only sing and do not use mechanical instrumental music and other kinds of music in their worship are truly seen as something peculiar in the modern way we use the word peculiar or maybe I should say better, an oddity. Generally, it's expected that a church's worship will include mechanical instruments of music of some sort to some degree. I remember back when I was probably about 14, maybe 15, I don't remember. There was a fellow about my same age, another boy, and he was invited to go with us to services. And we got in the auditorium and we were barely past what would be like back here, these doors into the actual auditorium. And he was looking around and the first question he asked was, where is the piano? And that tells you right there just how odd it is to walk into an auditorium of a church where people worship God and you don't find a place for mechanical instruments of music. And thus, what's going on here? And we in the church ought to ask, well, why don't we have them? Everybody else does. I might say this when it comes to, quote, everybody else does, unquote. That right there raises all sorts of red, red flags. Because never, when you read your Bible, you learn this, never has it been that the majority has voted right when it comes to serving God. And I know why, for there is a way that seemeth right unto a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. Brethren, we're talking about what makes Christianity what it really is, as the Bible teaches it. Christianity is the religion of Bible authority. And the love principle never rises higher, nor makes null and void, nor sets aside the authority principle. The love principle will always lead a person to obey Jesus. Thus Jesus himself would say, Why well, call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I command you. Remember, Jesus declared before he left this earth, following his resurrection, Matthew 28, 18, that all power or authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. That's very significant. And as I said, the verse following Colossians 3, 16 is the one that's written on the wall above my head. Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Well, we wouldn't be able to do that if it wasn't for the truth that Jesus spoke in Matthew 26, um, 28, 18. You couldn't do it. So why do faithful children of God engage in singing only as we worship in song? Is it a matter of preference and nothing else? I've even heard it said, sometimes people say, well, folks just don't have much money. They can't afford a piano or an organ or whatever. And that shows the limits that some people have placed upon their own thinking and their own understanding of the scriptures. I again want to emphasize because this undergirds everything there is about becoming a Christian and living the Christian life. The answer is it's a matter of New Testament authority. Thus what we do in worship must be authorized. I cite again Colossians 3.17 and also I'll add to it John chapter 4 in verse 24, uh, we worship God. It's imperative. It's a must. You can't get around it and be acceptable to God. You must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And that covers then the music that we would use when we're worshiping God. Some people don't even think of singing as music. I don't know why, but it is. Now, there may be some of that singing that might make the cats crawl up the wall. I don't know. But nevertheless, 
it is singing. And if it's coming from the heart, that's what God wants to see are people submitting to his will. Because you can't prove your love of God and not submit to his will. You can't prove your faith in God without submitting to his will. There are four ways to determine what God has authorized. Let's always remember that language communicates. Thus, it will communicate authority. And Jesus, in his language of the inspired scriptures, communicates what he has authorized. It does so in the way any language functions, by direct statements, one of which is a command. Examples and implication. Now, you can't have a language if you don't have that about the language, for that's the way it communicates anything. If I say, sit down on the front pew on my right, that communicates my wishes concerning you and the front pew on my right. Thus, it's a direct statement, and it communicates that. You, ca you can't do a thing in the world about setting all of that aside because it is what's called coval. It's a natural part of the way a language works. And even those who want to fight against the authority of a language that is communicating the will of God will have to use direct statements, examples, and implication to be able to do it. So it's self-refuting when they try to set it aside for how do they communicate their ideas to other people except by language and the way language works. So this is a natural part of the communicative element of language. And no human being invented it. We did identify, for sake of grammar, let's put it this way. A verb in a sentence was doing what a verb does in a sentence long before people, for sake of identification and classification, called it the verb. It was doing it, and thus we identified it. Same thing's true of the subject of a sentence or the direct object. We did that for sake of being able, even again in communication, to understand how languages work. And if you don't know how to work the language, you don't know how language works. Now think about that a minute. If you don't know how to work the language, you don't know how language works. Consider again, singing is authorized. Now, I add to this Colossians 3.16, Ephesians 5.19. It virtually says the same as Colossians 3.16. But notice in both those passages, Christians in worship of God in music are to teach one another in this manner. So it's not just from the heart in spirit worshiping God, showing your devotion to God. I must be mindful of the fact that what I'm saying is teaching all those around about me. And that's the reason I don't understand some brethren. And I've seen it everywhere I've preached. And I've heard it from other preachers and visiting other congregations. People will claim to be of Christ, Christian. They'll claim to be worshiping God. And when the singing is going on, they hardly have more than a murmur. Well, I wonder how you're teaching the fellow around you. God may know exactly what's going on in your heart. But you're not complying with what the scripture said when you just worship God. It says plainly that we're teaching one another. We're also told in James 5.13 that even when we're happy as individuals out here, we're to sing psalms. I had a fellow ask me one time, well, where do you get the idea that you can sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs by yourself? Well, the idea came into my mind from the idea of God, which was written in the words of God, signs of ideas, in such a passage as James 5.13. That says right there that a person who's happy, let him sing songs. Now, it doesn't mean it's a solo in the collective worship of the saints because everybody is to be worshiping there. See, we're speaking to one another, which means everybody's speaking. That sort of does away with the chorus to stand up here and in proxy worship for us, singing to us. Or where you have somebody in the church stand up and sing a solo in the worship of the church 
everybody that's a Christian is to sing psalms, sing the spiritual songs, and sing them loud enough to teach your neighbor. Now, maybe you don't want to be heard, but that doesn't make any difference. What did God say? We can have brethren who are really fuss at the denominations. Why don't they just do what Acts 2, 38, 1 Peter 3, 21, Galatians 3, 26 and 27, Mark 16, 16. Why don't they do that? It's just as plain as it can be. Well, it also says right here, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. Seems to me, if you understand Acts 2.38, you ought to understand that one. And it says each one of us is to worship God or it's not acceptable worship. It's not in spirit and in truth that we're to be speaking to one another. And we're to be, of course, singing with the Spirit and with the understanding also. Paul talks about that, and even though he's dealing with miraculous gifts in that assembly, the idea is still there. Understanding. How can they be teaching without understanding? Let's just put it that way. How can you speak something that teaches somebody else without the person that you're speaking to understanding? There can't be any, any learning without understanding. It is our custom to talk about the sermon and say, and the lesson. Well, really, technically, you preach a sermon, there are lessons in it. <laughs> but the point is, it's not going to benefit anybody out there if they don't understand the words, no matter whether it's Jesus speaking or Paul speaking or poor little old me speaking. There's going to have to be on the part of the audience an understanding of the words and if it's to do the person any good, the application of those truths in those words to their own lives. Or else how would you ever know to respond to the invitation to obey Christ if you're not a Christian, except that you learn you should and what it takes to do so. So Christians are to sing with the Spirit and with the understanding. Our heart's in it, and we're singing so that we understand ourselves, of course. That's an important point. But also those who are around about as we teach them in song. They understand what we're saying. Now, I've run across a few brethren who will say, well, you can't be standing over here singing, four or five of you, uh, outside the assembly, church quote is over. Uh, you can't do that. If you sing, everybody around you has got to sing. All right, it's unscriptural. I, I, I don't know really what to say about some of that, except that, Singing is a, for, is a type of reading. You realize that? Singing is a type of reading. Now let me ask you this. Can you stand over here and read the Bible to somebody? Yes. Then could you sing it to them? The same verse you just read, a normal way of reading, could you sing it to them? Well, you say, I don't think you could. But that's exactly what God says you must do in the worship. When you're singing, you're teaching, and there's words conveying a message. So the idea of saying that if you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, you can't do it by yourself. Everybody that's around you have got to join in, or you're wrong to sing it. It just won't hold water. The very psalms, the book of psalms, was a psalm book for the Jews. Well, does that mean that the only way they could use those psalms is when they were chanting them, which is what they did? Uh, no, they read them too, you know. But they were reading them in both cases. One was reading to a chant form of delivery of the reading. The other was simply just reading it without a chant. But it's reading it nevertheless. We do have the example of Paul and Silas singing hymns while in prison. In Acts chapter 16, 25, that you'll remember was in Philippi. And the prisoners heard them. They were singing hymns. That means spiritual matters were involved in the words they sang. And the prisoners heard them. They understood what they were singing. Regardless of the numbers assembled, Christians will comply with the teaching about singing in Ephesians 5.19. 
singing and speaking to one another. Colossians 3.16, Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. It also shows us the kind of songs specified that we're to sing when we worship God and that we speak one to another. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. It's not going to be love me tender, love me sweet, hold my hand, kiss my feet. It's not going to be that. Not going to be any secular song. Not anything like that. That's what's authorized. Know what I said about authority? You cannot understand New Testament Christianity if you don't understand it is religion of Bible authority. It's not a religion that says just wink at heaven and say, God save me, then I'll do it any way I want to. The same would be true with some people's idea of worship. It's the idea of abiding by the will of Jesus Christ. It's His church, and it's God that's being worshipped, and we want to please Him. How do I please God except to do what He wants me to do in the way He wants me to do it, when He wants me to do it? People are saying, well, you can partake of the Lord's Supper on any day of the week, and it's perfectly acceptable to God. There's nothing in the New Testament that says it was partaken of on any other day than the first day of the week in the worship assembly of the saints. Why do I want to stretch it out? It doesn't make any sense. There's no direct statement, thus there's no command found in the New Testament for Christians to use mechanical instruments uh, or any other kind of music. No uh, bass drums or tambourines or whatever humming or whatever else. It's not there. You say, well, it's done with the human voice. That's not what the Scripture says. The Scripture says human voice, but used in what way? Singing, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And you could hum a song all day long, and somebody doesn't know it, and all you know is that you hum the tune to him. You won't get the message. There's no example found in the New Testament of Christians using mechanical instruments of music in the worship of God. None whatsoever. There's nothing that implies that mechanical instruments of music was used in New Testament worship. If we take the Bible, and the Bible only, and all that the Bible has to say, specifically in the New Testament, then we can only come away with the idea that we're to sing and sing only in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and we speak to one another, and as we do so through those songs, we're teaching one another as we praise God from the heart. We're told plainly by Paul to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 13, hold fast the form, which would be a pattern, hold fast the form of sound words, wholesome words. And you won't find mechanical instruments of music as well as other types of music other than singing as a part of the form of sound words or pattern. That's all. Now, the question I ask is, why can't people be content with that? Well, a lot of them don't know how to write about the Word of Truth, which we must, 2 Timothy 2.15, as we study the Bible. They don't realize, because they're not hearing it from their pulpits. They certainly don't hear it from, from the churches. Because what they're going to hear there is lip service. Jesus is Lord. Someday, the Lord's going to say, if you knew I was Lord... Why did you do as you pleased as it was to suit you? When I already made it clear in my day on earth why I call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say. People can't get by with that kind of thing. It just won't work. Well, here's some attempts to prove that mechanical instrument of music or other kinds of music is acceptable to God. Usually somebody will say, Well, it doesn't say not to use them. And they don't understand the principle of silence that's taught in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 14. We don't conclude anything from somebody regarding what that somebody's will about something is, except that that person gives us his ideas and words. You just don't. Somebody says, well, I read between the lines. Folks, as far as I know, there's not a thing in the world between the lines. I know sometimes what people mean by that. But literally, there is nothing between the lines to read but space. God communicates His will to us on everything in words which are signs of ideas. 
That's the way thought travels in vehicles of thought. Those are signs of ideas. And when it comes to Jesus being a high priest, the argument that is made by the inspired writer of the Hebrews, that if the law were still binding, Jesus couldn't be a high priest. Well, why is that the case? Because the only thing the law of Moses had to say about from where priests came was the tribe of Levi. And Christ came to the tribe of Judah. Of which Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. That's exactly what he said in verse 14. So his argument is he said nothing about it. Therefore, how can you conclude that's what you ought to do? So we do only what's specified. We go back to what was written before time for our learning, Romans 15, 4 in the Old Testament. We go back to the days of Noah, looking at Genesis 6 and 7 and all through there, and build me an ark. Choose any kind of wood you want to, it's up to you. Now you would immediately say, that's not what the Bible says. Well, why would you say that to me? Because on other things the Bible says, we go ahead and say, just do what you want to. God told Noah to build me an ark of gopher wood. Now you say, I don't know what gopher wood was. That doesn't make any difference whether you did or you didn't. Noah did. And God did. And language having meaning and the idea of God being the kind of wood he wanted that Noah knew about, he said gopher wood and Noah knew what it was. And in specifying the wood, he limited kind of wood and that's all there is to it when it comes to that kind of thing he limited it now if he had said go for wood plus pine then he'd been go for wood and pine but since language communicates the will of God then when he said go for wood let's just be content to leave it with go for wood why that's what God said but he didn't say not to but he did. When he said, go for wood, that limb did the kind of wood. And the only way you would know there would be any other kind of wood to be used would be if he had said it. But he didn't, did he? And we could say here what was said about Jesus, of which tribe, Levitical tribe, the tribe of Judah rather, of which Jesus or which the Moses said nothing. Well, you could say something of which God said nothing except go for wood. He said nothing about any other wood. Authority is communicated through words, not through silence. Now, parents have got all over their kids, and when we were growing up, we probably got jumped on, as we would like to say it, by our parents because we did things they didn't tell us to do. Or we acted upon our own. Do you think, Back in the days when parents loved their children up the discipline, even with the rod, do you think a child ever got a spanking for doing something he shouldn't do? And the mama or daddy would usually say, I told you not to do that, or I told you to have that done by this time of day. And I let you off yesterday, and I allowed you to go ahead and do it today, and you haven't got it done now. So go out to the peach trees and break me off a limb about two feet long. Don't come back with a little bitty one or you'll have to go back and get a bigger one. Of course, you know all of that is politically incorrect and you don't love your children if you do that and all of that kind of stuff that's contrary to God's will, contrary to the love of parents for children, contrary to rearing in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But nevertheless, when it comes to us, as children of God in the worship of God. We do it only as He authorized, and that authority is in words and words specify. Now there were, no doubt, mechanical instruments of music in the Old Testament. Just read the last uh, psalm of the, uh, of the book of Psalms, Psalm 150, and he'll mention a number of them. People say, see, they were faithful and they did it. Why can't we do it? Because we're not under the law of Moses. When's the last time, if you're going to use that kind of argument, you went out and offered up a, a turtle dove or a pigeon or a lamb or a calf? They did that in the law of Moses. Perfectly acceptable. In fact, they didn't do it. Certain times they'd be sinning. So if you're going to argue it right here with singing, then you're going to argue for all other things the law of Moses charged them to do to be well-pleasing to God. 
It doesn't make any sense to do that. We're not under that law. Colossians 2 and verse 14 makes it very clear that he has taken away the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, that was contrary to us, blotted them out and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And I can say the whole letter of the Hebrews is designed to show we're under the New Testament of Christ as law to Christ, the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25, and not the law of Moses. Do we benefit from Old Testament things? Yes, I started this sermon off on Romans 15.4, pretty close to it. Whatsoever things were written before time were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. That's the Old Testament Scriptures. But what do they teach? If God teaches this is to be done, then you do it. Well, the laws change. That principle doesn't change. You still must obey the Lord. Somebody will go over and read Revelation 5, verse 8, chapter 14, verse 2, and they know it's a book of symbols and figures. And they'll say, see, there's harps in heaven. If the harps are in heaven, we can use harps here on earth. First of all, those are not literal harps. And besides that, if they were literal harps, all it would authorize would be harps. But you've got a piano. And you've got a trumpet. And you've got an organ. So you can't use that even if it were literal harps. Because you don't, how many of these churches do you see with harps in them? And that's all they have. Because of Revelation 5, 8, 14, 2. But if you read 14, 2, it'll talk about harpers with their harps singing. It defines it for you. Singing does that in Romans 14, 2 and 3. It doesn't just mean uh, that they used harps. It's figurative language to say they were singing. Harpers harping with their harps and then it will say singing. It's just that simple. It's defined for you. Besides that, we're doing on earth. And remember, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But I don't know what all they do in heaven according to God's will that's fitted for heaven. But I know from the New Testament what's expected of us here. I know that uh, angels don't give or take in marriage in heaven. But I know that there are teaching of the New Testament that must be believed and obeyed concerning man and woman being married. So the idea is we ought to want God's will for us here on earth to be done even as it is in heaven, whatever the will of God is there for angels, etc. Somebody will say, well, it's an aid, which means it's, it expedites the singing. It's an option, uh, such as a song book or a tuning fork or what's that thing you blow? Yeah, a pitch pipe. Somebody says, that made a mechanical sound. Did y'all hear that? He didn't sing. I heard him. He did not sing. He went, but he didn't go bent with his mouth, did he? You sinned. And somebody says, well, when you get the pitch from that little thing, it knows when to shut up before the singing begins. All it does is give you the pitch. If for some reason there was a piano over here, let's say we're in a rented hall and it's used for various things, we're worshiping there at the piano. And I said, would you go over there and hit middle C? Boom. All right. All right, it all starts there. We're going to sing. We ain't going to shut up. It gives you the pitch. Now watch. Singing is not just pitch. There's nobody that sings any song that doesn't sing in some pitch. It may be be the office pitch too high or low. But if you sing, you're going to sing some pitch. What this uh, pitch pipe does, or the tuning fork does, is help you get the pitch the songwriter gave that song. And then we sing it. Now that helps because it helps you sing in the pitch the song was written in. The song book helps you do only what God obligated you to do, that which he authorized, which was what? Sing. In fact, I'll pick on our illustrious young song leader here that did such a good job today. Where is a song leader even authorized? Can you read of a person being a song leader in the New Testament when they worship? I can. So is he authorized? Well, at least 
he selects the song. And at least he gets everybody started, whether they stay with him or not. And in that sense, he's helping do things decently and in order, which is an obligation we have, whatever we do. The pews you're in, how do you know they're authorized? Well, you don't have to have them, do you? You could stand up the whole time. Or you could sit in the floor. Well, they just help us. Notice help. Aid to help us while I'm standing here preaching or whoever it may be. So we need to understand that an aid is only an aid if it helps you do only what God obligated you to do. It helps you discharge the obligation. Now, there is no even room to talk about an aid if you don't have an obligation to discharge. None whatsoever. So we get our obligations from the authority of the Lord, and that's how we learn that we must believe, we must repent of our sins, we must confess our faith in Christ, and we must be baptized for the remission of sin. Those are obligations. When it comes to the baptism, there's all sorts of aids that we can use to give us water deep enough to bury somebody in. But we didn't talk about that at the obligation to bury people in water and baptizing them wasn't there. And so you begin to see that a piano or an organ is not an aid. If it hits high C, it doesn't mean anybody here is going to hit high C. It may hit it. It doesn't mean you are. It doesn't help you sing. It's another kind of music. That's the point. You can be quiet all you want to. And it, for somebody who knows how to play a piano, can go right ahead and play and not a soul sing. It's another kind of music. When you have specification, it specifies, specifies the kind. And the kind is singing. Not mechanical instrumental music. We have an instrument that we must use. The heart strings of the heart are plucked. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So from the heart and with the heart we sing. So this is not a thing that's expeditious. We're taught that all things are lawful. But all things are not expedient. 1 Corinthians 6, 12. Meaning that is that even when you have authority to act, that doesn't mean that everything is advantageous. Because if it's expedient, there's an advantage to doing it. Song book, there's an advantage to having a song book. It helps you do what God obligated you to do. Microphone, my old favorite. Where is it authorized? Because it helps me do and helps you do what we're expected to do when a lesson's being given. When we sing, we teach. And mechanical instruments of music cannot teach. But as we can teach by reading a verse out of a printed Bible, as I said earlier, so we can sing a verse, a form of reading out of a printed song book. Just remember, when you have an obligation established because it's authorized, whatever helps you do, discharge the obligation, is itself authorized. You cannot read in the Bible where there's a church building and church property like we have right here. You can't read of it. It's not there. Then where's the authority for it? Well, we are taught to assemble. The church does have a work to do. And such a building as this helps us do in that assembly what we're supposed to do and other things that Christians are obligated to do. Then that thing itself is authorized. Great many brethren don't understand a lot about that, so they just say, oh, it's just a matter of what you like. And so we go down the denominational path where they all do what they like. And we're just another human church among human churches. So when we sing, we do so to teach one another and to praise God. And why do we sing only? Because it's authorized in the New Testament, Colossians 3, 16, 17, Ephesians 5, 19. Regardless of personal preference or prevailing practice, this is what we must do to please God. And for those that love the Lord, they will keep His commandments. And if you say, I love the Lord, but I don't keep His commandments, then you need to know you don't love the Lord. 
If you call him Lord, but you won't do what he says, then quit calling him Lord. Say, I'm here to serve myself and do as I please. That's why we emphasize so much what Lord said himself in accomplishing what we couldn't do that he did for us and dying for us. But he didn't want to go, go through all that terrible, horrendous thing, but he said, not my will, but thine be done. And that's the attitude of every person that comes to Christ and remains faithful. Not my will, but thine be done. If you're not a child of God, we've studied today what the Lord's will is for you to become a child of God. If you haven't done that, then you're not a child of God. As a child of God, if you sin, there's a second law of pardon. Repent of your sins, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. This is a time we use to encourage people to obey the gospel or to be restored or to confess sins. And we don't want to miss a time to do that because this is the only time we have. You don't have five minutes from now. You have now if you want to straighten things up. So if you do, we urge you by our love for God, you, and for the truth that you respond to the gospel invitation while we stand and sing.